Hi everyone, I'm Nick and welcome back to Lafayette Systems. I design built and fly rockets with active control systems just like this one. It uses these four aft fins to steer around and it keeps getting better every single flight. It can fly profiles with pitch, yaw, and roll commands and it can now fly to waypoints in the sky assigned via radio data link. I'm currently doing a build series for this rocket, making a second airframe and upgrading it to fly with first stage boosters. One critical part of this design, build, fly process is modeling and simulation, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video. These control systems have lots of tunable parameters, and different guidance and control structures can lead to dramatically different behavior. We want to know what the rocket's going to do when you hit the launch button. One way of doing that is to put the rocket on the rail, fire it, and see what happens. Given that the consequences of having a rocket control itself the wrong way can be pretty expensive or even pretty dangerous, we want to be confident that we know what the rocket's going to do before we even fly it. And that's where we need to lean on modeling and simulation. In other words, this video is about predicting the future using math and a little bit of physics. Today we're going to talk about three different modeling and simulation tools that I use at different stages of the rocket development process. First, I use standard rocket simulation tools for initial sizing and stability analysis. Next, I'll use a MATLAB tool that I made for guidance and control evaluation. Finally, I'll use hardware in the loop simulation to test the flight software's control, sequencing, and data logging. In this video, we're going to go into detail on all of these steps and how you can use them to help design and test your own rockets. All of these simulation tools are meant to keep you and your rocket safe out of the launch site. But what about keeping you safe on the internet? That's right, nerds, it's an ad read. I don't know anybody who's managed to avoid the avalanche of spam calls, texts, and emails that seems to only be getting worse. One of the reasons that your info may end up in the hands of the people sending out the spam is that big companies that you've entrusted with your data can't seem to keep it from getting stolen. Internet and cell providers, big tech companies, even governments who have your personal data continue to suffer data breaches. More of our personal data is in the hands of bad actors than ever before. The sponsor of today's video, Aura, helps secure your personal data both before and after these data breaches occur. First, Aura provides a built-in VPN, antivirus, and password manager. All of these tools help keep you and your family's personal data out of the wrong hands in the first place. Their AI-powered call assistant will even pick up your phone for unknown numbers and scan the calls for scams. Aura will also help you if your data has already been leaked. Aura scours the internet for your phone number and other sensitive info and alerts you if they find it. You'll also receive a fraud alert if anyone tries to access your credit or bank accounts using this stolen information. Now this is just scratching the surface on what Aura can do, so if you want to keep yourself safe from online threats, you can go to aura.com slash Lafayette Systems and try your first two weeks completely free. The link's in the description. So, you want to build a rocket. Step one is figuring out the size, shape, layout, and what rocket motors you plan on flying. For this initial work, an open source rocket simulation tool like OpenRocket is my go-to choice. This software lets us add major components like a nose cone, a body tube, and fins to get the general shape started. I'll then add some mass components for things like parachutes, a control system, flight computer and battery, and I'll check the design's stability. Stability of your rockets is really important, and it's a primary driving factor for me during the early design process. Stability measures how much your rocket tries to point into the wind if it isn't flying exactly straight. Your stability margin is the distance between your rocket's center of mass, where it rotates around, and its center of pressure, the point on the rocket where you can model all of the aerodynamic forces acting. Stability is generally measured in calibers, or the diameter of your rocket. A good rule of thumb is to keep your stability margin between one and two calibers, with a center of pressure behind the center of mass. If you mix those two up, your rocket tries to fly backwards and does this. To increase your stability margin, you can add more fin area to the back of your rocket or move its center of mass forward. You can see here that this rocket is just barely stable, and if it weather cocks when it leaves the rail, it could tumble. This is where I find out that I need to rearrange some of my airframe or add additional fins to the design. As I continue to design and build the rocket, I'll weigh and measure it and update this open rocket model with real values, making sure the stability and performance numbers are staying where I want them, not just for some conceptual rocket, but for the actual rocket as built. Open Rocket also lets you simulate flights using a variety of commercial rocket motors. You can change all sorts of parameters like your launch altitude, the angle, and winds to see how high your rocket is expected to go. This time to apogee number is also very useful in planning your ejection charge delays. 
Now, there's a lot of great videos out there going over how OpenRocket works, and I'll link some of those in the video description. OpenRocket's a very useful tool, and it's completely free and provides awesome documentation. For standard rocket designs and layouts, it's proven to be quite accurate as well. That lets us do stability analysis without complicated CFD or wind tunnel testing and get good enough results to continue. The thing to keep in mind throughout this journey is that no model is perfect, but some models are useful. Open Rocket is one of those models. It won't tell you exactly how high your rocket will go or how stable it'll be, but it gets you in the ballpark. If we're conservative with our stability in particular, we can be pretty confident that the rocket will behave safely even if the model has errors. So Open Rocket is a wonderful tool, and if you aren't adding a control system to your rocket, you can pretty much stop there. But one of its downsides is that it doesn't easily let us add a complex control system to change the rocket's roll, pitch, and yaw. This brings us to the second and my favorite simulation tool, the full MATLAB model. I've made a series of MATLAB and Simulink models that basically take the aerodynamic equations from OpenRocket and run them in MATLAB with the added ability of being able to angle the fins and motors. For you non-engineers out there, MATLAB is an IDE and language that lets you write anything from short little math scripts to these complicated data analysis tools. It makes it very easy to do linear algebra in particular, and its control systems toolbox is both very user-friendly and very powerful. Simulink is a simulation tool inside of MATLAB that uses drag and drop blocks to simulate you know, basically whatever you want. In this Simulink model, I can add blocks to create and test guidance and control systems, I can add motor thrust, aero forces, and more. This block diagram interface makes creating complicated systems pretty straightforward. Now, before I dive into how my Simulink and MATLAB model is structured, I've got a little bit of a caveat. So my model turned out to be pretty accurate. It's got some other unique features to it, and modified versions of it turned out to be useful for uh, more professional applications, we'll say. So for those reasons, I don't think I'm allowed to show it to you. We are going to look at a simplified version of the model instead. My goal here is to provide a good starting point for your simulation environments without violating any export control laws. So here we have our stand-in Simulink model. It's based around a six degree of freedom block from the aerospace block set. This includes force and moment inputs, and then the block outputs both linear and angular position, velocity, and acceleration. Using MATLAB function blocks, we can add our aerodynamic equations that describe the forces and moments on the rocket as functions of things like airspeed and angle of attack. We can add an additional subsystem for gravitational acceleration, and maybe even another one for atmospheric turbulence. Pressing run, we can see our little rocket wobbling around. To add a control system, we can create an additional subsystem including, for this example, a PID controller. This PID system will generate the fin output angles based on our Euler angles, our yaw pitch and roll, and our angular velocities. The output of our PID controller can be sent to the aerodynamics block. Here we take account for our fin angles when computing the fin angle of attack, and then we press run. You can see now that our rocket's controlling its roll and pulling up to vertical. The second reason I think this tool is useful is that I can add what are called nonlinearities into the model. The easy tools available to control theory and dynamics, things like Bode plots and root locus, make two very important assumptions. First, that the system behavior is a linear function of its states, and second, that the system behavior is time invariant. For things like a balance spot or an inverted pendulum, these assumptions are totally workable. For rockets that have a changing mass and aero forces that change with velocity and altitude and all sorts of other inputs, these assumptions are actually pretty terrible. If we don't account for these nonlinearities in our MATLAB model, it won't accurately reflect what we see in real life. With Simulink, I can easily add nonlinear effects like actuator rate and angle limits and control surface precision. For most of my designs, nonlinearities are primary design drivers. In other words, most of the decisions that I make revolve around these nonlinear effects and my ability to mitigate and simulate them. Now, I use this tool to simulate the control system and tune its gains. Control gains are the tunable parameters that choose things like how hard the rocket tries to correct for any disturbances. Flight data will help me tune these gains even further, but I can generally get to within, I don't know, 20% just using this tool. That's usually safe enough for a first flight. Now this flight won't be perfect, but the goal of these first flights is just to have the rocket survive and to get that really valuable flight data to tune the gains further. All of the simulation so far has been purely academic. 
we're designing and simulating some hypothetical rocket and control system, and we're relying on some kind of simplistic laws that describe the physics that the rocket is behaving with. The last step involves our actual rocket hardware and the flight code responsible for controlling it. This is Diamond X's flight computer. It's responsible for navigation, guidance, and control, or where are you, where do you want to be, and how do you get there? In flight, its navigation system is tracking the rocket's position and orientation. The guidance code decides when to pitch or yaw, and the control system sends commands to the fins to make that all happen. The flight computer also controls a bunch of other important things like logging the flight data and deploying our parachutes. All of that stuff should be tested on the ground before we fly with actual flight hardware and software. Simulating in MATLAB is great, but if I make one tiny error translating the MATLAB code into C++, the rocket might spiral into the ground. The problem with testing this stuff is that the triggers for these events are generally things like how high the rocket is or how quickly it's moving. Now, it is impractical for me to lift the rocket to thousands of feet in the air inside of my house, so I need a way of convincing the flight software that the rocket is doing something that it's not actually doing. The good thing is that the whole where am I step of the rocket code is all inside of this one navigate function. A lot of this hardware in the loop testing is going to involve me injecting fake data into the navigation system so I can test the pieces of code that rely on navigation's outputs. Instead of listening to our accelerometers and barometric pressure sensors, during these ground tests the navigation system can listen to my fun suggestions instead. So what does this look like? I have a build flag that I can select when I compile my code that adds this fake nav data. With this ground test flag set, we can see some additional pieces of code here that are included during compiling. For example, this set in read sensors adds a fake acceleration from thrust after liftoff. This tricks the inertial navigation system into thinking that the rocket is screaming through the air. This other chunk of code tells us to ignore the barometric pressure sensor, which will be dutifully reporting that the flight computer hasn't left my desk. With this code uploading and running, we can simulate liftoff by picking up the rocket firmly. We can see the fins moving and the rocket's reporting its position as some 800 meters in the air. As the rocket reaches its pretend apogee, we can see that it changes state to recovery, pops its parachutes, and then logs its data to the SD card after fake touching down. Another ground test feature is the guidance test system. As we discussed before, my MATLAB code might work great, but for the rocket to function properly, I need to make zero mistakes converting the MATLAB code and block diagrams into flight software. The guidance test system lets us do that. It's actually really simple. First, we're going to look at a guidance test when we are controlling the rocket's attitude, and then when we're trying to fly to waypoints in the sky. This is an attitude guidance test. This mode pretends like the rocket is already traveling at speed, and it moves the control surfaces to try and point straight up. I can test this out of the field to double check my control gains and make sure my servos are all working properly. I'll tilt the rocket one way, and then I expect the fins to try to take it back to where it started. So what about when we're trying to fly to waypoints in the sky instead? If you remember from the last video, the waypoint guidance system generates lateral acceleration commands. In real life, a two-stage control system turns these into fin deflections and finally into the rocket accelerating laterally in the air. To simulate this, we just need to take those acceleration commands and add them to the sensor readings just like we did for the thrust earlier. Now, to be clear, in flight, it's still up to the control system to make these acceleration commands accelerations in reality. But this at least lets us test the guidance system and the guidance gains as they've been implemented in flight code. So let's look at an example of the guidance test system in action. This is a recording of the ground control system during one of these waypoint guidance ground tests. We can see that the waypoint has been assigned and the rocket's onboard systems are tracking that waypoint. Now watch this horizontal scenario diagram closely. The red dot is our waypoint and the blue dot's our rocket. And we can see that the red dot is inside of this band between the minimum and maximum kinematic range rings. That means that this is a good waypoint and we're okay to launch. The rocket lifts off in launch direction hold mode, transitions to waypoint guidance, and pitches towards that waypoint. After passing that waypoint, we can see its closest approach value reported here as 0.2 meters. Now, this missed distance has like four asterisks after it, and I won't get into those now, but if you're interested in this waypoint guidance system, definitely go check out the last video. In that one, we achieved about a 15.6 centimeter missed distance on a real rocket launch, so this guidance test system seems to be accurate enough for my purposes. This brings us finally to the control test, which lets us test, you guessed it, the control system. 
The control test feature sets the flight computer into a new control mode. This executes a fin test to make sure that all of our fins are moving in the correct order, with the correct deflection angles, and in unison when they're supposed to. Now you guys see these fin tests a lot in my videos, because I think they look super cool. After simulating these flights, we can check our data log and our major event log. These are two of the three files generated by the flight computer while it's running. The MEL is a text data log of all of the important things that happened during the flight. In the MEL, we can see things like liftoff detection, guidance mode changes, and parachute deployment. The data log is a big CSV file that contains the actual flight data. It'll show the altitude changing and our fins moving to control the rocket over the course of these simulated flights. When everything works during these ground tests, I get a lot more confident that the rocket's going to work in real life. Now at the end of the day, when we go to launch the rocket, it still might fail, and that's why it's important to include other types of safety systems. Diamond X includes a lot of features that safe either the guidance or the control systems if the rocket is not behaving safely. I won't go into detail on how each and every one of these safety systems can be ground tested, but I hope that you can see how a ground test feature like this can make those safety systems much easier to verify. These three simulation tools have taken us from the start of the rocket design process all the way through to flight test. Open Rocket helps us with conceptual design, sizing, and stability analysis. MATLAB and Simulink let us do control system design, maneuver planning, and preliminary gain tuning. Finally, hardware in the loop test validated sequencing, data logging, and the guidance and control laws on the actual flight hardware. Now there's definitely more I could talk about in the modeling and sim realm, especially how I use flight data to tune the simulation parameters, but that's going to have to be a topic for another video. That's all I have for now. Coming up, we've still got booster integration on Diamond X and its first two-stage flight. The detailed design on my rocket slash drone combo called Hatchet is nearly complete, and I've started building the first prototype of its cool onboard camera system. If you're interested in any of these projects, make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.